And I would like to welcome Joe, Joseph Bridenstine to speak to us today. I was hoping the place would be filled, but that was not quite a reasonable expectation, I think. Um, he came to talk to us about women, philosophy, and democracy. He's substituting at the academy and also teaching yoga. And in 91, received his doctorate in philosophy. What's your? Yeah, it's uh, 2021. 21. Yeah. You come talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the intimate group you wanted. Nothing? Hello. Yeah, dig. Thanks, man. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for turning up. Uh, apparently, um, my boss at the, the academy, um, Dr. Howell, was here. And she, from what I understand, she's speaking about community and, and education. Uh, so we're going to end on a similar note as well, just by a serendipitous coincidence, I suppose. Um, and so pretty much what I'm going to do for today is summarize the main points and contemporary significance of my new book that just came out. Um, the new book is called Nietzschean Feminist and Embodied Perspectives on the Pre-Socratics, Philosophy as Partnership, quite a mouthful. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the pre-Socratic philosophers are the first Western philosophers that predate Socrates. And um, the book, to be honest, is a little pricey, so I haven't brought any with me, but if anyone's interested in purchasing, purchasing a copy, it's available on my website, yogiphilosopher.com. Uh, I have a bunch of business cards I can pass out, and you know, we can chit-chat after the lecture and, and everything like that. And uh, so pretty much what we're going to do today is three parts. Uh, the first part of the lecture is we're going to go after the, or go, to, we're going to discuss the first part of my thesis, which is pretty much saying what I'm doing. And then the second part, which is going to take us much less time, is the second part of my thesis, which is why it matters. That's where we're going to get to the, the democracy part. And then part three is going to be Q&A. So pretty basic there. And so, yeah, I guess we'll just get started. And so pretty much the thesis of my book is that Nietzsche's views of philosophy itself, as well as his reading of the pre-Socratics, enables us to see that Western philosophy began as what we today would call a feminist religious reformation. Specifically, it began as an effort to revive within the largely patriarchal and uh, death-glorifying culture of archaic Greece, a paleo slash neolithic goddess-centered form of religion which emphasized rebirth. It's like the rebirth of life over the glory of death in battle, as you know, the Homeric heroes would uh, like us to value. And so just a few things here. Um, first of all, how does Nietzsche's view of philosophy do this? We're going to get to this at the end of the lecture, because this is part of, this is going to tie into the contemporary significance as well. But just uh, for starters, uh, the main theme here is, in, in order to understand the historical emergence of philosophy as a discipline, it helps to understand first what philosophy is and how does philosophical thinking emerge within the individual. So just put a pin in that and we'll circle back to that at the end of the lecture. And then moving on uh, from there, how does Nietzsche's reading of the pre-Socratics help us see that this is how philosophy began? Well, in contrast to the, um, the kind of scientific bent of a lot of scholarship, which portrays the pre-Socratics as, or discusses them as philosopher scientists, which they surely were. There was a lot of wonderful scientific thinking going on. Um, Nietzsche emphasized that they were primarily religious reformers. That the first philosophers, they were primarily religious reformers. And this has been supported by recent research, which shows how central theological uh, considerations were to the first philosophers, as well as them, how many of them were reforming Hesiod in particular. So Hesiod's cosmology, which is like traditional Greek myth. But that leads us to the question, if there, were, if there was a religious reformation, what were they doing? Where were they trying to steer Greek culture and religion at that point? And so my answer in the book is that uh, they were trying to revive the old European goddess religiosity that Rihanna Eisler spoke of in The Chalice and the Blade. For those of you who may be familiar, The Chalice and the Blade was a, a relatively famous text. It was a big influence on the Da Vinci Code kind of a lot of like the feminine undercurrents of Western civilization and stuff like that. And so for Rihanna Eisler, um, her model for what she calls the partnership model of community for her inspiration for that is Paleolithic Europe. And uh, so pretty much I support my thesis in four ways. First is the Nietzschean conception of philosophy that I already mentioned, we'll get back to that later. 
And second is by taking into consideration the biographical material of the pre-Socratics themselves. So we're gonna discuss their doctrines in a little bit, but also um, the pre-Socratics, the biographical material that we have from them shows not just an absence of misogyny, but a lot of pro-women uh, behavior and mentalities, uh, pro-nature, uh, very wholesome characters. And I also would like you, to guys, you guys to get a feel for these thinkers um, as people, as individuals. Uh, instead of just kind of nameless uh, or faceless philosophers. Um, so it's going to be the conception of philosophy, or you know, Nietzsche's conception of philosophy, the biographical reports, and then a major part in, in how I argue for this kind of, you know, my interpretation of pre-Socratic philosophy is the historical connections that the pre-Socratics had to Paleolithic Europe, which that makes sense. If they were trying to revive something, it would help if they knew what they were reviving. And so this is the major topic of the second chapter of my book, and I'm just going to briefly encapsulate the kind of historical cultural connections uh, that I talk about there. And so the basic message of Eisler's account of old Europe, Paleolithic Europe, is that it was a relatively um, egalitarian, artistic, creative uh, society, relatively peaceful. They in invested uh, women, nature, and sexuality with great spiritual significance. And um, unfortunately, there was, but, but unfortunately, there was a cultural transformation that took place between 4300 and 2800 uh, BCE, when the, according to Rihanna Eisler, and she bases a lot of her work on the archaeologist Maria Gambutas, the, the Indo-European Aryan-speaking um, peoples north of the Black Sea, which were called the Kurgans because of their burial mounds, they swept into old Europe about for three waves, again, during around 5,000 BC to 28,000, and they replaced the old European goddess religiosity with their kind of domineering um, mythology. So pretty much the nurturing goddess of old Europe, the earth goddess was replaced by the violent sky god from Yahweh, or Yahweh, Zeus, all that, all that stuff. And so um, Rihanna Eisler notes that like, we are still living under the uh, influences of this shift in Western culture and history from a partnership model of society to a domination model of society. However, partnership continued uh, in other places like Chitalia Yuk in Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey, and then in Sumer in ancient Mesopotamia. So Chitalia Yuk, we're talking 7100 to 5700 BCE. And there was uh, a lot of, lot of feminine religiosity going on in Chitalia, a lot of goddess worship uh, that continued themes from old Europe, uh, such as the unity of nature, the unity of ourselves with nature and, and animals and stuff like that. And then in ancient Sumer, which is 4500 to 1900 BCE, which is you know, in Mesopotamia, the most beloved and revered deity was Inanna the queen of heaven and earth, the goddess of love and procreation, whose traditions also retain elements that undoubtedly go back to the Neolithic and the Paleolithic. However, eventually Chitalia Yuk was overtaken by the Indo-European Hittites, and then Sumer eventually caved, there was a domineering, because of the pressure from their domineering neighbors, Sumer eventually shifted towards a dominator model of society and social order where the legitimate, the rule of the, of the king was mythically legitimized. So that's not, you know, that's too bad. However, uh, partnership even continued into Crete, Minoan Crete. And so if you're not familiar with Minoan Crete, you have all those islands in the Aegean. Minoan Crete is the big island, or the big, big island, the big one at the bottom that kind of looks like a boat. And so the story of Minoan Crete began around 6,000 BC when a small colony of immigrants, probably from Anatolia, so from the region of Chitalia Yuk, which is also where philosophy began. And it's important as Westerners for us to, for us to remember, Western philosophy began in Asia Minor. Asia Minor, which is you know, modern-day Turkey. So these settlers from Anatolia arrived on the island of Crete around 6,000 BC, and they brought their goddess religiosity with them. And so scholars have really fallen in love in, with Crete for a, lot, for a lot of reasons. Like, again, very egalitarian sensibility, very peaceful, you know, lots of goddess worship, singing, dancing, games. It looked like a real uh, hoot and a holler. Um, and, but for our purposes, the main significance of Minoan Crete is not just how it continues this kind of partnership lifestyle, but how it is also held to be the birthplace of the Eleusinian Mysteries. The Eleusinian Mysteries, which were for almost 2,000 years the most important religious festival in ancient Greek, in the ancient Greek world. And so, 
Uh, Nietzsche's view that the mysteries also provided an important source for early Greek metaphysics and cosmology has also been supported by recent scholarship, particularly Richard Seaford argues that uh, it, there may have been a physiological or cosmological doctrine being revealed in the mysteries. Um, and so that's where, you know, that's why the Eleusinian mysteries are such a linchpin for my argument, because they are, they, they come from this, you know, they are within this partnership tradition that came down from old Europe, and they were very significant for ancient Greece. And so in the Eleusinian mysteries, um, I guess, um, before I get to that, I will say, uh, talk about the fourth way I argue for my thesis. And the fourth method is the conceptual similarities between Paleolithic European myth and ancient Greek, or um, excuse me, pre-Socratic cosmology. So in the first mythology in old Europe, it was what I call a feminine and cyclical world. You had the all-steering goddess who specifically steered these cycles of life, death, and rebirth, the cycles of the seasons, all that good stuff. And that's what you also see in the Eleusinian Mysteries. In the Eleusinian Mysteries, from what we tell, or from what we can tell, because they were really very, very secretive for a long time, it was the goddess Persephone, which is the, you know, the queen of the underworld, she revealed the truth of rebirth to the Greeks and the truth of reincarnation to the Greeks by giving birth to Dionysus, the god of life. So you had that same, what I call feminine cyclicity. So a goddess directing the cycles of reincarnation, you have that in old Europe, you have it in the Eleusinian mysteries, and as we will see, we have that um, throughout pre-Socratic cosmology, and it bears, um, or it bears repeating or to keep in mind of just how different this was than from, I guess, what we could call mainstream Greek myth and culture, which I would describe as masculine and linear. So when, with Homer and Hesiod and, and um, you know, all that stuff, pretty much you're born, you live, and then you die, you know, you go to Hades. And Hades is not a great place to be. I think even Achilles said, I would rather be a slave on earth than a, a king in Hades. Um, but there's so, but also the best thing that you could do as a person, I suppose, is to die gloriously in battle. So in Homeric you know, religion and culture, it's the valorization of violence and you know, machismo, and it has this linear kind of trajectory of you're born, you live, and then you die. And that's in stark contrast to what we see in the pre-Socratics. And it, which brings back, this is a big part of like the Reformation part, is they're bringing up this feminine cyclicity, cyclicity instead. Um, and yeah, so finally, one more note before we get uh, moving to the next part. Uh, scholars have long recognized that during the Archaic Age in general, many Greeks were becoming dissatisfied with traditional Greek religion. And you can understand why. I mean, from primarily, there's no hope of a happy afterlife. It's really, really not much to look forward to. I mean, you go to Hades as a shade. And um, it is also well, you know, it's well known that they were looking for alternatives at this point. And so pretty much my answer is, this is what the pre-Socratics were doing. This is how they were responding to that spiritual malaise. You know, that spiritual malaise and dissatisfaction with traditional religion, which appears to be happening, you know, in our own time. And so that's where we'll get to the contemporary significance later. But so that being said, that's pretty much uh, you know, laying things out of how I argue for the thesis. And so what we're going to do for the remainder of the first part of the lecture is I'm just going to go through the major pre-Socratic thinkers, tell you a little bit about them individually, ask who they are as a person, and then just continue to build my case that this is what they were doing. And um, we will begin with Pericides of Syros. Pericides of Syros. And Syros is an island in the Aegean. Pericides, we're talking, he was around 580 to 520 BCE. And because of the largely scientific um, approach of many scholars, Pericides is, has largely been considered not as a pre-Socratic philosopher, but as a theological precursor to pre-Socratic philosophy. However, now that current uh, later research has indicated how, or revealed, how important theological considerations were for the pre-Socratics, scholars are more recognizing the importance of Pericides. But so for our purposes, uh, first, what we know about him as a person, he is known for his aversion to violence, he abhorred bloodshed. He was also known for his love of singing. He's a very musical person. And he was also instrumental um, in bringing the idea of rebirth or reincarnation to the Greeks. So one of the interesting things is it, with regard to reincarnation and the idea of reincarnation in ancient Greece, it pretty much shows up fully formed in contrast to India, where we can see it develop through different permutations and them kind of like fleshing it out. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, Pericides is responsible for bringing that, uh, we're not quite sure, but anyway. And then with respect to his doctrine, although his theocosmology, 
is patriarchal insofar as it portrays a male god, the god Zas, which is his version of Zeus, as being the primary figure, it also reformed Hesiod's cosmology in two specific ways, uh, important ways. Uh, so first of all, it reformed the, the violent nature of Hesiod's cosmology. If anyone's familiar with Hesiod and kind of his story of how the earth came to be, let's just say there's a lot of patricide, you know, a lot of violence of Kronos castrating Uranus and, and you, know, you know, all these things, there's, there's a lot of violence there. Um, but in contrast to the violent nature of Hesiod's cosmology, um, Pherecydes portrays Zas, which is his version of Zeus, as creating the world through feminine crafts, like weaving. So right there, there's a direct kind of reforming Hesiod into a more a peaceful direction. And as some of you may know, according to traditional Greek myth, Zeus is kind of a rapey dude. Like, you know, he's kind of portrayed going around chasing after all these women. There's like a lot of that kind of sexual violence and domineering kind of sexuality there. Um, but Pherecydes reforms that as well. For Pherecydes, there were three main gods. There's Zeus, Kronos, and then the earth goddess Chthoni, which is where we get the word like thonic from, or chthonic being under the ground. Um, and he emphasizes what we today would call the romantic or spiritual love between Zeus and Chthoni. So instead of Zeus being this kind of you know, predator kind of person for Pherecydes, he's emphasizing the romantic love between him and the, the goddess uh, Chthoni. So right there, even in the pre, you know, pre-stages or the beginning stages of pre-Socratic philosophy, we have direct evidence of this kind of reforming traditional Greek myth in this more peaceful, feminine way. And it, you know, it only keeps getting better. Uh, and so we'll move on to number two, which is Thales. Thales of Miletus. I'm, Miletus was a booming city, a big cultural hub and economic hub on, in Ionia, which is, again, modern-day Turkey, so that's An Anatolia, Asia Minor, Asia Minor, excuse me. And so Thales are around 640 to 548, so we're even reaching back into the seventh century with Thales. He's considered to be the first philosopher by many, um, but we know more about his life than about his work. However, what we do know is keeps, is keeps in line with what we've seen from Pherecydes. Thales was known to praise his mom's intelligence. He's going on record as praising his mom's intelligence, and there's another anecdote where he gets bested by a Thracian maid. So one of the reasons why Thales is considered to be the first uh, philosopher is he's also emblematic of philosophical absent-mindedness, as we tend to be. And so there's a story that as he was uh, reaching for the stars, or as he was exploring the stars, because uh, philosophy is very, um, very um, in tune with astronomy as well. So the astron many of the astronomers were philosophers and vice versa. So as, there's a story that as he was reaching for the stars or wanting to see the stars better, he got up onto a well. And he wanted to see the stars so much that he got a little bit too ahead of his skis. Excuse me, he got a little, a little bit too ahead of his skis and then fell into the well. And then after he did that, a Thracian maid was walking by and just kind of laughed at him. It's like, Thales, oh great Thales, you're so concerned with you know, heavenly knowledge, you forgot what's right in front of you. So not only do we have the first philosopher philosopher praising his mom's intelligence, but we have what should be, like he was, you know, all these philosophers, they come from the elite classes. So we have a lowly servant girl getting the better of Thales. In, in fact, kind of outwitting him or poking fun of him. So there's that theme of the affirmation of female intelligence right there, uh, which is very interesting. And so, moving forward to his doctrine, Thales was known to begin philosophy by saying that all is water. All is water. And when he says that, we have to realize he does not mean H2O. He's not coming to this from a modern scientific perspective. When he says all is water, he's saying all is the life force. Nothing can survive without water. And they say he came to this conclusion by noting nothing survives without water, nothing lives without water. So he's saying all is the life force. And I should say, this introduces one of the major themes of pre-Socratic philosophy, which is searching for the arche or the hypokamenon. So the arche, like we have the word archaeology or archetype or monarch, the arche is the beginning, the rule, like the first principle, the foundation. And then the hypokamenon from hypo, which is under, like hypodermic, and then kamon, which is to lie. So the hypokamenon is the underlying something. So the first philosophers were looking for what is that which underlies all worldly change, all worldly multiplicity? What's the first principle, the arche? And so for Thales, it's water. And However, his water fulfills the exact same cosmological function as the Paleolithic European goddesses. 
Namely, it is the source from which everything comes and is that to which all returns. It steers the cycles of life, death, and rebirth, as did the, you know, the great goddesses of old Europe. And what I do in my, um, in my book is I also argue that we can interpret Thales' water as a symbolic representation of specifically the water goddess Metis. So and my reason for doing so is as follows. Malaysian philosophy ran in the same circles as ancient Orphism. And the ancient Orphics were well known for concealing or hiding the identity of the great goddess in allegories, in symbols, in representations. And so I argue that if Orphism and Malaysian philosophy were so intertwined in these ways, and Orphics were known to hide the great goddess in these symbols or allegories, then that at least enables us to read Thales' water as a representation of, or a personif no, not a personification, of the aqueous goddess Metis, especially, especially since she is a wisdom goddess. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Metis. She's a goddess of wisdom that when Zeus wanted to take over, he wanted Metis's, Metis's wisdom. So he, can, he tricked her. He said, well, you know, if you're so great and powerful, transform yourself into a glass of water. So she did. He drank her. But she was also pregnant with Athena at the time. So she gave him a really bad headache. So he had Hephaestus just split open his head so she could, yeah, I think it was funny too. And, um, and so she escaped through the river Triton back to the Aegean, but Athena was left behind, and then she had her parthenogenic birth from Zeus's forehead. But, but she was the goddess of wisdom that Zeus needed that wisdom to rule, so he tricked her. So anyway, I just, I just think that's great. Or not, no, it's not great, but interesting. But yeah, so that's Thales. And now we're moving on to Anaximander of Miletus. So Anaximander, a younger contemporary of Thales, he was around 610 to 540. And in contrast to Thales, we know far more about his writing than about his life. Uh, and some also hold that he was the first philosopher, but that's, that's debatable. Um, but what we do know about his life, um, well, first of all, he, apparently he was a very gloomy character. He dressed all in black. I refer to him as a prototype to the nihilist in the Big Lebowski, because he was also kind of pretentious in, in a way, but that's just me having fun with my work. But what we do, the, one of the only anecdotes we do have from him is apparently he was singing one time, and the children were making fun of him. And he just said, well, I have to learn how to sing better for the kids. You know? Yeah, so you know, just that kind of gentle, nurturing kind of personality. We're going to see that throughout the rest of the pre-Socratics. Um, so he reformed Thales' water into the apiron. The apiron. The apiron is the opposite of our word empirical. Empirical means M or N within kairos, boundaries, the boundaries of experience. The apiron is the indefinite. It is that which out without boundaries. And so Anaximander reasoned as follows. If water comes to be and passes away, like the elements transform into each other, and if anything, is, anything that has qualities is limited by its having qualities, its having yeah, a, a kind of uh, sub or um, yeah, a specific quality, then nothing with qualities can be the eternal source. If everything with a quality rises and passes away, then what is eternal? must be quality less. So we have a major jump from a kind of quasi-mythological water to an abstract concept, which just in the history of thought is a monumental shift. But keeping in line with Thales, Anaximander's Apiron still fulfills that same function of steering the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. And even more, and this is another reason why we can even read Thales' water as being a representation of a goddess, is uh, Anaximander's Apiron has been described as being specifically a feminine maternal principle. It, give, it, is, it, it essentially functions as the mother of the gods. It gives birth to the planets and the gods. And it is also likely that it is specifically a representation of the goddess Persephone, who we saw was, was linked to the Eleusinian mysteries. And the reason why I say that is because debt is a major theme of Anaximander's um, work, where if things go too far in one direction, they pay their debt to the opposite. And so we, the Greeks held that we pay our debt to Persephone when we die. So there's that. But besides building on uh, Thales in that way, he also takes forward what Pherisides was doing by reforming Hesiod. So in contrast, I think this is in the, in the Pandora myth, but in contrast to how Hesiod portrays women as being created after or as a consequence of the separation of men and gods, so women are kind of like this afterthought that are only created once you know, men fell from divinity, Anaximander um, presents them as being created, men and women just being created at the same time thus equalizing them. So again, just another shift of the Hesiod narrative in a pro-woman uh, pro direction here. 
then moving on to someone you may have heard of, Pythagoras. Pythagoras, yes, the wonderful Pythagoras. Pythagoras of Samos and then later of Croton. So he's from the colony of Samos on or in Ionia as with the other philosophers, but then later he went to Croton in Italy. And so Pythagoras, as I said, like you may know him as the Pythagorean theorem, the harmony of the spheres, and yet he was around 570 to 490. And with respect to his biography, well, we really don't know much about him, but Pyth what we do know, one of the ways in which Pythagoras was very uh, unique among all the pre-Socratics, he was the only family man. Nietzsche even jokes, and Nietzsche is a prime example of philosophers tending to be bachelors. I'm not gonna get into why, I don't, I'm not, I don't even think I wanna know. But anyway, um, Pythagoras was, was a family man in contrast to all the other pre-Socratics, and he was also one of the only two pre-Socratic thinkers that I've ever found who have, scholars have referred to as a feminist. For his inclusion of women, he was known besides his wife, uh, Theano, he had three prominent daughters that they, all, they each took up prominent roles in the community, so, so upstanding daughters, and he, um, he's known, again, as a feminist for his intellectual inclusion of women, but even more than that, he, was, he is known, or he is, a physically marked adept in the lineage or tradition of Metis and or Demeter. How do we know this? Pythagoras was held to have a golden thigh. A golden thigh. It's not the case. According to Walter Bur Burkhart, what's really going on there is he had a tattoo on his thigh. And that tattoo symbol or uh, validated his participation in the lineages of these goddess lineages of Metis and Demeter. And the connection between the thigh and the, um, and the goddess is, a, um, I think, a trope in Greek myth that the most beloved of the goddess is wounded in the thigh. And you see this with Adonis. Adonis, the, the Adonis, you know, the beloved of Aphrodite, he died when a boar pierced his thigh. So Pythagoras having that thigh, I call him the man with the goddess tattoo in, in, in the book. But again, that's just me having fun with this. But yeah, so he's a phys you know, physically marked addict in these goddess lineages. And even beyond that, beyond the intellectual inclusion of women, beyond you know, all this stuff, he is reported to have learned most of what he knew from a Delphic priestess, the Mysticlea. Apparently, as the story, as legend has it, <laughs> um, after his beloved teacher, Pherisides, died, uh, Pythagoras went to the Delphic Oracle, the Mysticlea, um, and she's, she's the one who sent him from, uh, from Samos in Ionia over to Croton in, in southern Italy for, for a diplomatic mission. And so, finally, uh, with regard to the um, biographical reports, the main significance of Pythagoras here, for me, is that he is arguably the most important pre-Socratic thinker. To some extent, according to Hans Georg Gadamer, to some extent, every other pre-Socratic thinker is portrayed as a follower of Pythagoras. So, if he was the most influential pre-Socratic thinker who set the tone for pre-Socratic philosophy, and he's such a feminist in this way, so pro-women in this way, and literally being physically marked as an adept in the lineage of uh, Metis and or Demeter, Demeter, Eleusinian Mysteries, Paleolithic Gear of everything I said, as someone on my dissertation committee said, like, she's like, this is where your argument is at your at the strongest. So that's Pythagoras is a big deal on that front. Unfortunately, he is also emblematic of the tenuousness of our grasp of antiquity, which should always be kept in mind. So we know very little about what he taught, and the Pythagoreans are very well known for their secrecy, but we also do know that he's pretty much synonymous with reincarnation, that he really brought reincarnation to the fore. So again, this most influential pre-Socratic philosopher, not only like really robustly pro-women, but also really into reincarnation. So there's that feminine simplicity again, just boom, right there. And moving on from, uh, from Pythagoras to someone who hated Pythagoras. But you may have also heard of this cat, Heraclitus of Ephesus, or Ephesus, Heraclitus. He is the rock star of the pre-Socratics. You talk to any, any philosophers, any scholars, they have, oh, Heraclitus, everyone loves Heraclitus. He is known as the dark one, the obscure one. He's got that real kind of tortured soul, gloomy poet kind of you know, rock star thing about him. And he's the one who said, all things flow, all flows, Pontarea, everything flows. No one steps into the same river twice. That kind of stuff. Our first Western process philosopher. Um, and with respect to his bi uh, biography, his hometown of Ephesus, 
was sacred to the Amazons, the big, beautiful Amazons. And ever since, it was named after its Amazonian fower, founder, excuse me, women were accorded a special privilege or special honors at Ephesus. So he comes from a very pro-women pro place. And we see his link to goddess religiosity in two uh, explicit instances, or I guess one explicit and one implicit. Um, he dedicated his one book, the only book he wrote, he dedicated it to Artemis at the Temple of Artemis. And then as a member of the royal family, he served as a priest of Elis, Eleusinian Demeter, and he was also known as a cookion drinker. A cookie, the cookion was the sacrimonial beverage um, that they drank at the Eleusinian Mysteries, which helped them uh, in certain pharmacological ways gain a vision of, of rebirth. And so Heraclitus, even though I'm, I would be surprised if any of the pre-Socratics didn't participate in the Mysteries, we know that Heraclitus didn't, because he's known as a cookion drinker. Okay, so that's that. Uh, well, then getting to his, uh, his doctrine, contra the Epiron and uh, number, oh, I should have said this, but um, with Pythagoras, for Pythagoras, all, was, all is number. Number is the RK. So we have Thales water, Anaximander Epiron, Pythagoras number, or excuse me, Thales water, Anaximander Epiron, Pythagoras number, but with Heraclitus, he goes back to the elements. Fire, all is the living fire, it's the ever-living fire. However, he also says that strife, or war, is the source of all things. And his word for strife is the word iris, which is a feminine noun. So at least here, there's a possibility that he did endorse a kind of feminine source of all things. Uh, and even going more than that, just as, you know, like we've said, the, the goddesses of, of uh, old European mythology, they steer the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. For Heraclitus, he has specifically feminine deities or feminine goddesses and the goddesses steer the astronomical cycles. Specifically, it's the Aeronese, which are the goddesses of vengeance, and then the goddess Justice, direct astronomical cycles. And then he also carries the idea of rebirth even further by explaining it as a process that, it, that happens through elemental transformation. So it's important to keep in mind, rebirth wasn't just a belief that they had. They were interested in explaining how it worked, and it wasn't just something that happened to human beings. Rebirth was the cosmos itself was rebirth, was rebirth. So reincarnation is a cosmic process. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's Heraclitus. How are we doing here? Oh, okay. And so moving on, number six, Parmenides of Elia. Parmenides of Elia, now we're firmly in southern Italy. So we've moved out of Ionia, now we're in southern Italy. Parmenides is 515 to 450. Father Parmenides, as Plato refers to him. Father Parmenides, the founder of Western logic, the founder of Western ra rationalism, as Peter Kingsley would argue, arguably the founder of Western civilization. I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, that's a big order to fill, but Peter Kingsley is very uh, emphatic on that point. Yes, yeah, so if Pythagoras was the most influential pre-Socratic for the pre-Socratics, Parmenides is arguably the most pre-Socratic thinker for the history of Western civilization. And uh, one thing that I will mention about his biography is that he is also deeply steeped in Pythagoreanism. He was reported to have been led to stillness by the Pythagorean Amanius. And Peter Kingsley interprets that as actually he was led to enlightenment. He was led to what the Indians would call samadhi. Um, but we can see this Pythagorean strain in um, Parmenides in his poem. And so it always, just as Western philosophy technically originated in Asia Minor, Logic originated in a poem. And so Parmenides' poem is really the apex of the kind of partnership, kind of feminist uh, tradition that I'm, that I'm tracing. So it recounts the journey of a kouros, and a kouros in a, is an anonymous male initiate to the mysteries. It recounts a journey of the kouros to a great goddess where the goddess reveals logic to him. The goddess reveals logic to him. And the thing about this poem is that besides the kouros, besides the anonymous male kouros, who may be Parmenides, and maybe the kind of textbook, you know, everyman figure that we can identify as, as observers or readers, besides the kouros, every figure in the poem is feminine. The mares that drive his chariot to meet the goddess, they're all feminine. The daughters of the sun that meet him at the gates of night and day, they're all feminine. And obviously the goddess is feminine. So it's a highly feminine poem. And even beyond that, so what the, the goddess does, it teaches, so for Parmenides, he uses logic to just say that being, not number, not fire, not the pylon, just being. All is being, being underlies, you know, this is ontology, the study of being that underlies the world of flux. 
Um, and for him, he even describes being itself, existence itself, as being held together by feminine love. So right for this Greek, existence itself was inherently feminine and inherently loving. Um, but even beyond that, for Parmenides, the process of philosophical divinization, which is using philosophy, using reason to think divine thoughts, to think like a god and to awaken one's inner divinity, philosophical divinization takes place as a process of specifically cultivating a feminine form of embodiment and subjectivity. So pretty much becoming a philosopher is becoming a woman. Becoming divine is becoming feminine in this way. And uh, that is a major inspiration for me. We can talk about this more in the Q&A, but I also do argue in the book that philosophy is specifically a feminine form of subjectivity. And many people would say, like, how can you say that? You know, it's actually a very old idea that goes back to arguably the founder of Western civilization in that, in that regard. And then, of course, you know, besides his ontology, when we get to his cosmology, big surprise, we find a goddess directing the cycles of life, death, and rebirth explicitly this time. Like, there's really, you know, no denying it. And so he is, Parmenides for me, is the zenith of the conceptual similarities between Paleolithic European myth and pre-Socratic cosmology. We have one more person here, and that is Empedocles of Agrigentum or Akragas in South Italy. So we're staying here, we're staying here in South Italy. Um, Empedocles, we're talking 494 to 434. He anticipated Darwin's theory of revolu or revolution, of evolution. He talks about through chance combinations, cre you know, creatures coming to be and everything like that, and it's just really fascinating. Uh, and he is also, Empedocles is also the only other pre-Socratic that I found has, who has been referred to as a feminist. And there are a lot of good reasons why <laughs> in the biographical reports alone. So by reason of his ample wealth, he gave dowries to many girls who could not afford them and whose families could not afford them. When miasma, which is pollution, uh, when pollution uh, from a neighboring river was causing women to miscarry, he paid to have two rivers diverted into that river to sweeten the water to stop the women from miscarrying. And then he himself performed sacrifices to bring a woman uh, back to life who had stopped breathing, as well as to cure another woman, Panthea, whom doctors had considered to be beyond health. So just a lot of just, obviously, pro-women doing a lot of good, not just you know conceptually, as we'll see, but really walking the walk in that way. And finally, as the uh, melodramatic uh, character that he was, he committed suicide by plunging into the volcanic Mount Edna, which apparently spat up one of his bronze sandals. His bronze sandals. Nobody wears bronze sandals. No, nobody wears bronze sandals. The bronze sandal is associated with the goddess Hecate, another underworld goddess. Hecate, I think she's a moon goddess. She's associated with dogs. Um, but so right there, besides all just his pro-women behavior and, and just everything he's done, or he's, he did, he's also directly associated with another underworld goddess through his bronze sandal that was burped up. And so, like Parmenides, and, oh yeah, just like Parmenides, Empedocles, Empedocles has a goddess steering the cycles of life, death, and rebirth in his cosmology, only this time it's Aphrodite. It's Aphrodite who's doing this. Um, however, even though he does um, have a goddess doing this, she is no longer the only one. So the preeminence of the goddess steering life and death and, and rebirth is not the case with Empedocles. And because she is now outflanked by his male god, which we'll get to in a second, and also by a, new, a neutral force called Strife. Strife. Um, however, his main significance, as far as I'm concerned, oh, one more thing, he also associated feminine love with a specifically philosophical kind of intelligence, just as Parmenides did, so there's just that little aside there. But his main significance for me is that whereas Parmenides is like the zenith of the conceptual similarities between pre-Socratic cosmology and, and old Europe, um, Empedocles is a major argument in favor of the historical link that I, that I spoke of. And so what happened in his cosmology, after creatures evolved and then after humans evolved, what happens is we all kind of coalesce into what uh, scholars have thought of as, well, on the one hand, he describes it as his god, this is the male god, but also commentators have noticed that the consolidation of the god doesn't negate the individuality of all the people. So they've gone for a kind of superorganism approach here, like a flock of birds operating as one organism in a school of fish. So for Empedocles, um, 
at one point, we all kind of coalesced into this superorganism, this idealized society, and scholars have recommend, or scholars have suggested this is actually a, a nostalgic yearning for a Neolithic peaceful community. And so one of the, one of the tactics um, as, as an academic is whenever you're coming across with like a brand new idea, it, it can be very difficult to sell people on that idea. So pretty much what I'm doing is I'm saying, this is already there in the literature. I'm the, not, I'm not the first person to say this. Scholars already have suggested that Empedocles in particular is trying to revive this kind of Neolithic, part, you know, I say partnership at this Neolithic peaceful society. And I'm just taking that and running with it. I'm just saying, yeah, that's what they were all doing. And the reason why they say this is that even though he describes this as, this ma as a male god, other scholars have talked about this as an idealized feminist community. They even talk about it as a velvet revolution or something like that. Um, because in this community, it's Queen Cyprus, Queen Cupris, which is Aphrodite. After Aphrodite was born, she arrived and came to shore on Cyprus. Uh, it's Queen Cyprus that absorbed everyone into her body and all creatures are living in harmony and, and peace. And so besides that kind of correlation of goddess worship and then peace, this superorganism uh, begins to fall apart when strife pierces into it and then what happens is the male gods take over and then people become more violent. Sound familiar? Like this is, this is what Rihanna Eisler was talking about with old Europe is you have the peaceful uh, um, partnership community with the goddess worship, but then when the male gods and sky gods and violent you know, gods came over, then people began to uh, kill each other, essentially. And so that's about it for, for the thinkers that we're gonna consider in detail. So after Parmenides and Empedocles, both explicit goddess imagery and the idea of rebirth vanish from pre-Socratic thought. And I argue that this is because of the increased influence that Sophism had on the pre-Socratics. So if some of you may be familiar, especially with Plato and Socrates, the difference between philosophy and Sophism is a major issue. How do we tell, tell the true philosophers from the Sophists? And there's a lot of literature on this debate, or, but pretty much for me, philosophers are, you know, the, philosophy is the love of knowledge. Philosophers are about um, working through dialogue, that's why Plato wrote dialogues, conversing with people, trying to find the truth. Sophists, they just want to win arguments. They just engage in what the Greeks called heuristics. And Sophism arguably goes back to the, the, the poet Simonides, who is known to relish lying to people. He was the first one to sell his poetry, so he's materialistic, and he was also blatantly misogynistic. So in contrast to philosophy, Sophism is characterized by a very macho kind of culture and also very materialistic and misogynistic. And so after Parmenides and Pedicles, they started to influence, you know, the Sophists were gaining traction and they started to influence uh, the philosophers more. And that's why I argue, or I argue that that is the reason why the last two pre-Socratic philosophers, namely Anaxagoras and Democritus, Rebirth goes away, explicit goddess imagery goes away. There's some implicit goddess imagery, but that's, um, you know, it is what it is. But then also, that's also when we get the first instances of misogyny in pre-Socratic philosophy. And even then, it's very tenuous, even with Democritus. Um, like, Democritus, you get the, the thing of, oh, women are more evil than men, or they're more inclined to evil. But that also may be by Democrates instead of Democritus. But the bottom line is here, with the influence of Sophism, the kind of partnership reformation thing that, I, that we've been tracing this entire time, that goes away. It's no longer about reforming religion, it's about uh, getting rid of it, essentially. However, um, both Anaxagoras and Democritus are linked to Demeter, and they are both obviously philosophers, and when you look at their biographical material, they're also really cool dudes, as, as the other people that we've been speaking about. So even though they're on like the downward trend of pre-Socratic philosophy, they're still part of what I call the partnership tradition. They're still part of everything. And that's important because the last thing I'll, I'll note before we move on to part two is that Democritus has as strong a claim as any other Greek for being the first to use the term democracy. I think there are two other Greeks that may, may be uh, helped to, to do that, but Democritus was the first one. And so if that's the case, if democracy, the word democracy and the concept originated with Democritus, then it's not just philosophy. It's democracy that, at least in that extent or to that way, goes back to the Paleolithic partnership kind of society that I've been, that I've been talking about, that partnership tradition. Okay. So now we're going to move on to part two where, you know, I'm going to talk about why this matters. 
And um, the part two is Nietzsche and Rihanna Eisler on embodied and social cognition. Embodied and social cognition. We're gonna, gonna get to that in a second. So pretty much the second part of my thesis is just as Nietzsche enables us to have this new perspective on the origin of philosophy, contemporary philosophers in general uh, and women philosophers in particular can and should use this new perspective on our past to work to fulfill Nietzsche's ideal of the philosopher as cultural position. The philosopher as cultural position. So what separates the philosopher from a scientist, let's say, is that philosophy, it's not just a disinterested, speculative you know, thing. It's about working for collective healing, communal healing, you know, communal education, and, and that, that sense of community. And specifically, I argue that we should return to this um, original conception of, of democracy as this kind of partnership of religious reformation in order to create a new spiritual foundation for Western democracy today. And so, yeah, I guess um, and in order to do that, so pretty much philosophy as a spiritual practice is, a, is an old notion. You know, that's been around for a long time. And what I'm arguing is that it not should be a spiritual practice, but it should be this kind of feminist, kind of reform, reformative practice so that we can have, a, we can, um, I guess, protect and improve the cultural and even spiritual foundations of Western democracy. And I guess as a disclaimer, I should just say, just I'm just done with secularism. You know, we can talk about that later during the Q&A. We can have a good old philosophical argument about it. But I think, you know, democracy needs a, a spiritual uh, foundation. And that's not to say that we didn't exclude other religions. That's, that's not what I'm going for. But that begs the question, then what is democracy? What do I mean by that? How are we going to build democracy or, or have that kind of spiritual foundation? And I agree with John Dewey, who recognized that democracy is more than a form of government. For John Dewey, democracy is more than a form of government because its essence consists not in abstract rights, but in the exchange of different ideas and the common deliberation that underlies collective decision making. You know, the spirit of democracy is you know, coming together, working together, having the conversations, working towards collective goals for the greater good. And so pretty much I take that and run with it to say that the essence of democracy lies in philosophical discourse in our ability to think of new ideas, to listen to different ideas, and you know, to kind of have these kind of open-minded discussions. And I think more than today, it's very clear that that cannot be taken for granted. Open-mindedness is a skill. It's a skill, and unless it's continually nurtured, you know, we have a tendency to ossify. We have a tendency to get locked in our own echo chambers and views. And this is why, you know, this is why philosophy, and especially the humanities, are so important. You know, helping people, you know, to think outside the box and have these more creative, like left brain kind of intelligence instead of the more analytical, or um, right brain instead of the more analytical left brain. I always get those confused. However, if, philosophy, or if uh, democracy depends on, demo the, excuse me, if democracy depends on philosophy in this way, well then what's philosophy? This is where the Nietzschean conception of philosophy comes in. So we're gonna, I'm gonna start tying things in. We're almost at the end, we're, we're, get, we're gonna tie it in here. And so, in contrast to uh, science, in contrast to how science generally has a more kind of critical, analytic, uh, paradigm-confined way of operating, where science is more about working within a structure and figuring things out instead of questioning that structure or you know, thinking outside the box, philosophy specifically consists, for me in, and for Nietzsche, in specifically uh, creative and self-reflective forms of thinking. So creative intelligence, being able to think of new ideas, being able to have original ideas that you, know, you haven't thought of before, and also to be self-reflective. And um, there's no formula for this. There's really no formula for creativity, just like there's no formula for genius. No, excuse me. I mean, that's why I'm very skeptical about the AI art and stuff like that. I just think there's no, there's no substitute for that human quality. Um, how, um, and one of my ways of, of illustrating what I'm talking about here is that as a writer, and maybe some of you have experienced this as well, I've had multiple days where I just spend all day writing, you know, first thing in the morning to the afternoon, and then I have to get away from it. But it's only later, particularly during a yoga practice, that like, oh, that's what I should have been thinking about. That's, you know, you have these, these insights, these reflections, and I have learned to be very sensitive to when they occur, to when I have new ideas, new ideas, when I have new reflections. And um, I, I can say it, um, it, it's in this way that as Nietzsche said, Philosophy is more of a pathos than a practice. It's something that happens to you, these philosophical, creative, and self-reflective thinking that kind of happen to you, and you want to kind of tune into that. Um, but although there's no formula,
or philosophical thinking, it can be nurtured. It can be nurtured. Just like you can't force plants to grow, you can provide the soil and the water and the sun, or not the sunlight, but, but the light for them to grow. So you can create the conditions, but you can't make them grow. And aside from, you know, stimulating your mind and reading and kind of, you know, tilling the soil and tending the land intellectually, you can also cultivate it through the body. And Nietzsche shows how we can do this um, by emphasizing, or for Nietzsche, philosophical inspiration, these, these philosophical pathi that we experience, they arise from the unconscious creativity of the body. The unconscious creativity of the body. And this is another uh, thing in academia that I think is, uh, should be, or hopefully is falling by the wayside, is the nothing below the neckism and the cerebralism. You know, thought doesn't just occur here. Like the ancient Greeks, like Empedocles, they held that thought occurs in the heart. Because I think they were more in tune to how to the intelligence of their body. And the intelligence of the body and the embodied nature of, of cognition in general has been supported by recent research. Uh, for example, in spinal cord injuries. If, you're, you know, if your spine is traumatized, it will learn how to adjust to that trauma. It will learn how to reshape itself. And ultimately, I think uh, even you could argue that intelligence all the way goes down to single-celled organisms. You know, they learn to get away from certain things. They learn to, to go towards certain things. So intelligence and, and, the, and cognition, you know, is all throughout the body. And for me, as, especially as a yogi and a philosopher, it's by being in tune with my body and my, my feelings, I found that to be very helpful for facilitating philosophical inspiration. And the main point here is that by, by extending the mind throughout the body, embodied cognition also extends the mind throughout society. So that's where we're moving from embodied cognition to social cognition. And uh, we'll continue, um, we continue to understand the social nature of cognition by, turning, by going back to our old friend Rihanna Eisler, who I mentioned. So we mentioned you know, partnership and domination, how like partnership, old, old Europe, domination, the Indo-Europeans. And so those are, so for Rihanna Eisler, according to her theory, underlying the various political systems that we've seen throughout history is our species to gravitate to either one or two social models, each society incorporating one or, the, or incorporating both of them to various degrees. So it's not an, an either or kind of thing. And so basically there's the partnership model of society where communities are held together by mutual pleasure and shared enjoyment. Uh, I think a healthy human brain is wired to receive more feel good chemicals when you help other people than when you help yourself, than when you help, when you help yourself. You know, it's, it's fun to participate in communities. Like, it's, it's very fulfilling in that way. So partnership communities, they are held together in that positive way of the joy of community and cooperation and the joy of giving, let's say. You know, very, very basic. The dominator model society is the opposite. This is when communities are held together by the use or threat of violence. And so with respect to social cognition, the main point here is that each of these models, as Rana Eisler has, has demonstrated or indicated with her colleague Douglas Fry, excuse me, each of these models of society also facilitate different neurochemical profiles. They change your brain, you know. So this is the social, um, social um, cogni cognition part of it. And long story short, whereas partnership, the partnership model facilitates philosophical thinking, the dominator model inhibits it. Stress makes you stupid. I mean, we all, we all know this. If you're, if you're constantly stressed, you may be operating on a very basic level of, I need to get this done, and you know, kind of very rational, whatever. But if, you, if you're a professional, especially if you're an artist, and you're like, you need to create, you need to do your work, you know you need to be in your proper space. Physically, emotionally, mentally, you need to you know, let the creative juices flow. Uh, we can get into more detail in that during the Q&A, I suppose, but <clears throat> that's basically the main thing there with the social cognition is these different social models inhibit or facilitate philosophical thinking. And building upon that, whereas partnership societies tend to value women, dominator societies, they tend to be patriarchal and misogynistic. And I equate partnership with democracy, not just because that, I think it's pretty intuitive that that partnership ethos of cooperation and the joy of cooperation, that's about the collective decision-making process. That's, you know, that's the good stuff. But also, um, as Jason Wilson has pointed out, or I, I equate domination with fascism, because as Jason Wilson has pointed out in an, in an article for The, for the Guardian, um, fascism, he argues, is really just an exacerbation and a more militant expression of the patriarchal relationships between men and women that have been happening for centuries. Um, that is, fascism, patriarchy isn't, isn't fascism. They're not identical, but it's kind of the psychosexual foundation of fascism. 
Um, and this has been uh, really made clear uh, specifically in the book, The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide by Hudson, Bowen, and Lee, where they illustrate just the numerous ways in which the oppression of women jeopardizes political stability for, for everybody. And so it's in this way that, um, you know, I, I consider that women's issue, or excuse me, that promoting, you know, positive attitudes about, as well as improving the lives of women and girls, it's not just a women's issue. That is as vital as the humanities and philosophy are for, you know, retaining and preserving the cultural foundations of democracy, um, even the psychosexual um, foundations of democracy. And so this is why, this is, <laughs> this is a big part of my work, and like, if you're not on board with this, you're probably gonna hate like everything I do. Um, but so I am, you know, I've been feeling this way for a strong, or feeling this way strongly for a long time, that we need to shift as a species to a more feminine status quo. More peaceful, more feminine, because when you, if you study feminist literature, you can see patriarchy isn't just patriarchy, it manifests in any number of ways that wouldn't at first uh, appear that way. Um, and also, something I've also been concerned with, uh, and I, I don't think I'm alone with this one, is as Westerners, Western civilization, I think we do need another rebirth, another renaissance, another big change for the 21st century. Like, you know, this is a major century that we're getting ourselves into, and I think we need big ideas and big uh, shifts in our culture to deal with that. And so that's why I argue not just shifting towards a, a more feminine future, but also a, a spiritual feminine future. So big on the promoting the goddess religiosity there. And I, I suspect that shifting to a more, um, you know, promoting goddess religiosity and feminine spirituality could inaugurate such a rebirth of Western culture because it led to the birth of Western culture, or at least the birth of Western philosophy and democracy. And this is where we're going to tie in Nietzsche's conception of philosophy to my thesis. I'm going to show how that goes together. So we're almost at the end here. And so we can see how goddess religiosity gave birth to philosophy by unpacking Rihanna Eisler's observation that the, the uh, personifications of the, of the divine both reflect and reinforce cultural values. And the basic idea here is that nurturing female personifications of the divine both reflect partnership values and ideas and reinforce, reinforce them. But then personifying the divine as a violent man, big surprise, it both reflects dominator values and norms and reinforces them. However, just as male figures like Dionysus and Jesus can be used to promote partnership, female figures can also be used to you know, reestablish you know, patriarchy and these kinds of things. So, and because of that, there is not a necessary causal relation between goddess worship and improved living conditions for real women, but historically speaking, there is a correlation. So there's not a causation there, but there is a correlation because appearances matter. Appearances matter, and if you have a culture that is used to worshiping female figures, that is going to generally, generally translate into a better appreciation for women, although, again, that is not always the case. And so, the relevance of this to the birth of Western philosophy is as follows. Um, basically, mothers who are more taken care of and live in, live in more women-affirming countries, or, or countries, cultures, whatever, they are generally better able to provide the kind of maternal care and especially touch that is necessarily necessary for uh, brain development. So uh, the skin has been called a second brain. Because if, if any of you know, you know, you have a young baby, you gotta hold that kid. You know, we need touch in order to, in order to really grow and mature as, as, and, as human beings. And so in contrast to mothers who are more stressed and who are less likely to be able to give that kind of love to their children, because it's difficult to give if you're not given to. Uh, mothers who are living better conditions are able to do that. And so pretty much in a nutshell, based on what we now know about the importance of such things as touch and maternal care for brain development, and based on what we now know about the embodied nature of cognition in general, as well as the somatic sources of philosophical inspiration, it makes sense that the first philosophers came from regions whose millennia-long traditions of goddess worship would have provided the ideological and social and even relational conditions for the emergence of philosophical thinking on the individual level. So that's where I'm going with this, that the discipline of philosophy emerged historically from these sites because these sites had the kind of goddess worship that would have provided the conditions for that. And Brianna Eisler makes that observation in a footnote in The Chalice of the Blade, 
think it's around like page 216 or something like that. And so my entire book is pretty much a commentary on that footnote. She says, like, all these philosophers came from these regions of goddess worship. And again, I take that and I run with it. <laughs> and I do my thing. And um, it also makes sense that if that's the case, that they would be trying to steer ancient Greece in that direction. That the first philosophers would be trying to promote the kind of spirituality that created the condition, the social conditions for philosophical thinking. And so, in conclusion, you know, the notion of a philo that philosophy is a way of life is as old as the notion of philosophy being a spiritual practice. However, it's generally talked about as being an individual way of life. And so I show in this, and I argue that no, philosophy actually has always been a collective way of life, namely the partnership model of society um, that for me uh, are, is that I equate with like the cultural foundations of Western democracy. And I think that now is the time that this, um, it could also serve as the spiritual foundation of Western democracy. So the kind of spirituality that I've been describing of you know, goddess-oriented reincarnation and using philosophy to attain, to become divine over a series of uh, successive lifetimes, you know, that's very attractive to people. And the spiritual but not religious movement, from what I understand, is or has been described as the most significant spiritual or religious phenomenon of our time, and it shows no signs of slowing down. And so pretty much, I argue that um, it would be irresponsible not to meet the growing demand for healthier forms of spirituality in a way that also preserves democracy and, help, and helps democracy and facilitates that. And um, let me just cap it there. <laughs> right, thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I know I have a tendency to throw a lot at everybody. Um, and these are kind of far out there stuff, but that's kind of what I'm into. So. And I, I, I'm also, I tend to be right, so if no one else has anything to say, we can, you know, we can, <laughs> we can just cap it there. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you showing up and today. Have a good one. Stay safe, especially during the eclipse. I think we will be inundated from what I understand. So stay safe.